Libya's desperate search for the missing in the city devastated by flood. Four days since the dams gave way, the sea has been giving up the dead along its shore. Those who survived have the most harrowing of tasks. Before night fell in Derna, Emma witnessed a city bereft. When the torrent of water came down 50 metres wide with waves of around seven metres high, many people simply died in their own homes and then their bodies were washed out to sea. There are still 10,000 missing now with a growing risk of disease. Help is beginning to arrive but cannot come soon enough. Also on News at 10 tonight. Britain's biggest steelworks saved, but 3,000 jobs could go. The workers furious at the government's £500 million investment. XL bully dogs to be banned by the end of the year after a man is mauled to death. Luis Rubial is given a restraining order from going anywhere near World Cup star Jenny Hermoso and... Music for the multiverse hits Spider-Man composer Daniel Pemberton on the film scores of the future. A virtuoso record scratcher is just as skilled as a you know, virtuoso um, violinist. This is ITV News at 10 with Julie Etchingham. Good evening. After the initial horror of Derna's dams breaking in the dead of night early on Monday morning, Libya's stricken port city is still being put to the test hour by hour. Whether it's recovering bodies from the shoreline or frantically searching the wreckage for any who might have survived, now they face a new threat of disease and a lack of clean water. Tonight, Libyan authorities are limiting access to the city to make it easier for rescuers to dig through the mud in their search for the missing. It is a disaster that has already claimed more than 11,000 lives and over 10,000 are still to be accounted for. Our correspondent Emma Murphy and her team made the hazardous journey across Libya and sent this report from Derna. For all nature's beauty, it has its own brutality. Laid bare on what were once the streets of Derna. This is a tragedy of nature and neglect. The rains overwhelming the city then overpowering dams. The tsunami effect destroyed entire neighbourhoods. At least 5,000 are dead, even more presumed dead. Thousands were washed out to sea, their bodies now being returned by the tides. Bodies are scattered everywhere and the beaches are now teeming with corpses. We're still in urgent need of another technical crew to help recover these bodies and prepare suitable places for their proper burial. In this CCTV footage, you can see the power of the flood water as vehicles are swept along the road. The height of the waves reached the fourth floor and we could see it close to us. The waves swept people away from the top of buildings and we could see people carried by the flood water. My neighbours were swept away from the roof altogether. It is a massive disaster. The storm which caused the flooding was immense, but the city should have been protected by dams on the outskirts. They failed after years of neglect. This man lost his son, daughter, grandchild and many other relatives. He says nobody was prepared and he blames the authorities. But in a divided country with two acting governments, one here in the east and one in the capital Tripoli, finding those responsible will be as challenging as finding those still trapped. They're trying to get phone signals working in the fading hope of rescue not recovering. Some of the survivors' messages say that they are in a specific place and are asking for anybody to rescue them, but the rubble is an obstacle between them and the rescue teams. In a coastal place like this, there is often an awareness of the threat of a tsunami from the sea. Few could have expected a tsunami from land with destruction on such a scale.
Well, as you saw from Emma's report there, the scale of the disaster is almost impossible to comprehend, especially for those worst affected by it, and it is a country still in shock. Before the wall of mud and water hit, Derna was a bustling Mediterranean port city of around 90,000 people in the eastern part of Libya. Before darkness fell tonight, Emma sent us her own eyewitness account. This part of Libya was hit by Storm Daniel. There was a huge amount of rainfall in the space of just a few hours, and that overwhelmed the dams. And if you just look over here, you'll get an idea of just what this region faced. Up here in the hills, two dams were built in the 1970s. They were meant to protect this area from flooding. But given the weight of the water and the lack of maintenance of those dams, over the weekend, they gave way. And that meant that 1.5 million tonnes worth of water poured straight down the valley into the city, into the homes below. Now, what has compounded the situation is that people were told to stay in their homes whilst the storm took hold. Many did want to evacuate but couldn't because they were warned that the authorities were on the streets and they put a curfew in place. So when the torrent of water came down 50 metres wide with waves of around seven metres high. Many people simply died in their own homes and then their bodies were washed out to sea out there on the horizon. That is, of course, causing huge frustration in this region, especially as the death toll mounts. It's thought that there are over 5,000 people whose bodies have been recovered so far and many, many thousands more still missing. It is a constant operation out here to try and recover the dead. There is some hope that some people might still be trapped in their homes and could be found alive, but that hope is dwindling as every day passes. Emma Murphy there reporting from Derna a little earlier today. Back here now, and the government today hailed its move to pump up to half a billion pounds into Britain's biggest steelworks as a great deal for the UK. But a lot of other people don't quite see it that way. The money's going to help Port Talbot's Indian owner, Tata, convert the plant into producing greener steel. It'll switch from coal-fired blast furnaces to zero-carbon electric arc ones. But this won't only come at a hefty cost in public funding. It's likely to come at a major cost in jobs too, up to 3,000 could be lost. Labour called it spending £500 million of taxpayers' money to make thousands of British workers redundant. The UK's biggest steelworks is also one of its biggest polluters. But cleaning it up and protecting its future come at an equally huge price. I'm a steelworker through and through. I'm fourth generation, so it's, uh, it's all I know, really. Ben Groves has worked at the plant since he was 17. His job could be one of 3,000 no longer needed following today's announcement. All I'm thinking about is, um, am I going to keep my house? Am I going to keep my job? Is, uh, are my friends going to keep their jobs? It's, um, it's just complete uncertainty. The plant's Indian owner, Tata Steel, plans to replace Port Talbot's two coal-fired blast furnaces with greener electric alternatives. It's said without government help, the whole site is under threat. So ministers today announced a £500 million investment. Tata will put in more than £700 million. The government says this move alone will reduce the UK's industrial carbon emissions by 7%. But 3,000 out of Tata's 8,000 workers stand to lose their jobs. People here accept the need to decarbonise this plant. But while Tata and the government have hailed today as a defining moment for the industry, there is widespread disillusionment here about the future they've chosen and the scale of the job losses. Is that a price worth paying? That's completely the wrong way to look at it. We are saving uh, jobs which would have been lost. Without this investment, we would probably have seen the end of steelmaking, certainly in this part of the country, possibly in the whole of the UK. This is a transformation project. But critics say it's a missed opportunity. Electric furnaces don't just need fewer people, they can't produce the same quantity and quality of steel. Unions say the government is trying to do it on the cheap. The government say it was a choice between this deal and losing this entire site. Do you accept that was the choice? Not at all. But there are a load of options which will protect the order books uh, and enable us to grow. And decarbonisation could be a massive positive, but it seems that they've taken the easy way out 
and caused carnage to the industry that we love. He says the effect on Port Talbot could be disastrous, a town and its economy dominated for decades by steelmaking. Today's deal does secure its future, but for the workforce, greener also means smaller. Ben Chapman, News at 10, Port Talbot. Well, the funding plan for the Port Talbot Steelworks is the latest in a series of government interventions using taxpayers' money. The question tonight is, given the de decline of the British steel industry, is there a clear strategy here? Well, Anushka's in the studio with us to take a close look at the plan and all it might imply. So take us through it, Anushka. Thank you, Julie. Let's start by having a look at what's been happening to the steel industry in the UK. In 1970, it was enormous. We produced 28.3 million tonnes that year. But since then, that figure has plummeted to just 6 million tonnes last year, which still sounds like quite a lot, but it means we are now 28th in a global steel production league table. Now, here is the top five. China producing more than the others combined, over a billion tonnes of steel last year. Now, the decline here has seen Britain's steel workforce drop almost 80% in four decades. The Labour MP in Port Talbot welcomed any money for steel, but argued today's intervention wasn't enough. The question is, do you want to have short-term sticking plaster solutions that could well end up with us just continuing to lurch from crisis to crisis? Or do you want a really bold, ambitious, long-term plan like Labour's £3 billion clean steel fund? The critique is that this isn't a full industrial strategy, but a scattergun approach. Half a billion today, 300 million to Chinese-owned British Steel earlier this year, and for other industries, 500 million to Jaguar Land Rover, also owned by Tata for a battery plant, 75 million to Mini for electric cars, and another battery plant for Nissan, around 100 million. A former Downing Street advisor who helped to write Theresa May's industrial strategy welcomed today's news, but said the government was being quite reactive. There's a missed opportunity here that if they had acted more strategically earlier, we could have had more of a steel industry, more demand for British steel in this country, so sort of sustaining the industry. And by being reactive over the years, they probably missed that opportunity. So it's, it's not ideal, but it's a, it's a lot better than letting 8,000 jobs go, which is what might have happened if they hadn't intervened at all. Now, folk in government I spoke to today said just because they don't have a new document entitled Industrial Strategy does not mean these interventions are not strategic, saying they are all in key areas like steel, cars, green tech, but they are under pressure to do more. The GMB union points to these figures, saying why is 47% of steel ordered for HS2 coming from abroad. Can we insist that infrastructure projects use steel made in Britain? Now, there is a question mark on whether that would break global trade rules, but experts I speak to think it is possible. OK, Anushka, fascinating. Thank you very much for taking us through all of that. Thank you. The Prime Minister pledged today to ban American XL bully dogs after the death of a man in the West Midlands. Ian Price, who was 52, was mauled by two of the dogs and despite frantic efforts to call them off, he died of his injuries. A man has been arrested. It was the latest in a string of attacks, some fatal, involving the dogs. The proposed ban has been welcomed by many, especially in communities worst affected, of course, and by the original architect of the Dangerous Dogs Act. But there are those, including some animal charities and experts who still maintain a ban is the wrong approach. A quiet village, now the scene of the UK's latest deadly dog attack. This road in Stonnell in Staffordshire is now mourning the loss of one of its own, who was mauled to death in the middle of the afternoon. The victim was 52-year-old Ian Price. By the time emergency services arrived, he'd suffered multiple life-threatening injuries and died before reaching hospital. He'd been attacked by these two dogs, believed to be American Bully XLs. Both were said to be off their lead at the time. This is not the first time these dogs had been involved in an attack. Several people we spoke to today who didn't want to appear on camera told us of an incident early this year when the dogs were running riots near these shops, forcing customers to flee inside. The latest attack comes just days after three people, including an 11-year-old girl, were injured by an American bully XL in Birmingham. The Prime Minister has now moved to ban the breed. What we will do is bring together 
animal experts, experts in the field, together with the police, to accurately define the breed of concern, and then using powers in the Dangerous Dogs Act, ban this breed, and those laws will be in place by the end of the year. According to one group that monitors dog attacks, 14 people have now been killed by XL bullies since 2021. And this year alone, there have been 351 attacks caused by large bully breeds, which amounts to 43% of all documented dog attacks. But there are still those who insist any ban would be unnecessary and say the government's focus should be on dog owners instead. Every situation, even with what happened in Birmingham, till now I don't know who this owner is, how the dog got to the situation. Like, we don't know anything about the owner, who is meant to be responsible for this dog. When we buy a dog, it's our responsibility. As for the owner of the two dogs involved in yesterday's attack, he has been arrested on suspicion of manslaughter, as well as being in charge of dogs dangerously out of control. Pets who violently killed a man in a peaceful suburban village. Pablo Taylor, News at 10. There's more to come on tonight's programme, including... Donald Trump says it's very unlikely he would pardon himself if re-elected president and... The British composer pioneering a new sound for blockbuster movie scores. There's a sort of elitism where we look at orchestras and we go, that's proper music, and then people might look at dance music or hip-hop and they can be slightly dismissive of it. All that and more coming up after this break. Welcome back. One more troubling element was added today to the saga of the escape from Wandsworth Prison of the terror suspect Daniel Khalif. It emerged that on the day he went missing, almost 40% of staff at the jail, around 80 prison officers, did not attend their shift. The Ministry of Justice has insisted that all prison staff absences on that day were pre-planned and staffing exceeded required levels. Khalif was recaptured after a four-day police manhunt. Nine days ago at Wandsworth Prison, there wasn't just an inmate missing, but dozens of staff. The government has admitted that on the day Daniel Khalif escaped, 80 prison officers were absent from work. Now questions are being asked about whether one led to the other. I've actually spoken to the Prison Officers Association, who have let me know that when they are 20% down on staffing numbers in um, any given shift, it is only appropriate to be doing basic things such as exercise and feeding. So questions need to be answered as to what he was even doing in the kitchen in the morning in the first place. That day, 1,594 prisoners were held at Wandsworth Prison. 125 frontline prison officers arrived for their shifts as expected, but 80 didn't. That means 39% were absent. But the government says staffing levels were above the minimum required that day, adding that an initial investigation has discovered that staffing levels didn't contribute to Khalif's escape. But clearly something went terribly wrong here. The Prime Minister wouldn't comment specifically on staffing at Wandsworth, but says the government has increased the number of prison staff nationally. Since 2017, when it comes to the number of prison officers we have, we have 4,000 more prison officers than we did uh, then. So we are putting more prison officers in. With the particular circumstances of what happened at Wandsworth, what the Justice Secretary has done is initiated an independent investigation. Last year, the Chief Inspector of Prisons found 31% of staff at Wandsworth Prison were either off sick or unable to fulfil their duties. What we see is the knock-on effect of not having enough staff and of prisons becoming more overcrowded, which is prisoners locked in their cells with not enough to do. And the danger then is that we just increase the revolving door of people coming out, offending and going back into prison. Daniel Khalif has been charged with escaping in a van. The government has launched several investigations into what happened, but that hasn't stopped the wider questions about staffing in our prisons. Amy Lewis, News at 10, Wandsworth. 
Former President Donald Trump has said it is very unlikely he would pardon himself if he were convicted of a crime and elected again. He told the US TV network NBC that he already rejected the idea in discussions with advisers just before he left office the first time. Mr Trump faces four criminal indictments which he claims are politically motivated attempts to derail his bid to reclaim the White House. Well, uh, Donald Trump is still way out in front in the race for the Republican nomination, averaging more than 56 percent of support in the polls, way ahead of his nearest challenger, Ron DeSantis, who's on 13. If Trump wins the nomination, then head-to-head -head polls so far for next November's presidential election suggest he has a narrow lead of just half a percentage point over Joe Biden. Well, Dan's in Washington for us tonight and was watching this interview. Trump as confident as ever. What did you make of what you heard, Dan? I mean, it's pretty extraordinary, isn't it, Julie? This idea that back in 2020, Donald Trump uh, considered the idea of preemptively pardoning himself uh, and his family uh, and friends before he'd even been uh, charged uh, with anything. He discussed it with the White House lead counsel. Uh, and today uh, he told uh, NBC uh, uh, more details about the precise nature of these deliberations. I could have pardoned myself. Do you know what? I was given an option to pardon myself. I could have pardoned myself when I left. People said, would you like to pardon yourself? I had a couple of attorneys that said, you can do it if you want. Uh, I had some people that said it would look bad if you do it, because I think it would look terrible. It's a few things to say about this. First of all, that the whole concept of this is completely legally untested. Never in the history uh, of the United States has any president pardoned themselves. President Nixon, in the aftermath of the uh, Watergate scandal, considered it, but was told by lawyers that it, that it would be uh, illegal. The other thing to say is that it would only be possible in the cases that Donald Trump is facing in federal court, in state courts, he wouldn't be able to do that. And he's facing two serious cases uh, in state courts as well. The other thing to say, Julie, is that he said that it would be unlikely that he would consider pardoning himself if he got back into office. Well, that's not quite the same uh, as saying that he wouldn't uh, do it. And cynics would also point out this is a man that has done numerous screeching U-turns with things that he said before. <laughs> Just a few. OK, Dan, thank you very much indeed. Thanks. The crisis of England's crumbling schools because of rack concrete may have largely disappeared from the headlines for now, but for parents, pupils and teachers up and down the country, it is still very much an ongoing worry and a logistical nightmare. Well, Shehab's here with news of a school in East London that was at first told it could continue lessons, only now to be told to close its doors and send 1,800 pupils home. And what on earth happened here, Shehab? Yes, yeah, so this is Stepney Green All Saints School, which is a secondary school and a sixth form, which for the first two weeks of term was told that its school was safe and students were coming in. They were aware that they had rack. They, so I'm told, got in touch with the Department for Education. They put mitigation in place of their own accord. They were under the impression that they had followed all the guidance that had been put out by the government. And then yesterday, they heard from the Department for Education and were told that the school was not safe. The concern here is that students have been going to a place of study which wasn't safe for two weeks. The local MP, Roshanara Ali, has tweeted today saying that the school had been in touch and got no reply from the Department for Education for months and that they had chosen to do this mitigation themselves. The concern is how many other schools are in this position? This is a school that was aware it had rack in place. It's a school that put mitigation in and is now in this position. The head teacher who's written to all the parents has said that they're not too sure how long the school is going to be closed for. They've put measures in place to ensure that laptops are sent out to students, that there are online lessons taking place, but this is an incredibly complicated situation and this could be the first of many. There could be many schools across the country that are in a similar position. We just don't know yet whether this is just the first or whether there'll be more. Uh, only just back for the new term too. It's a really tough time for a lot of these schools. Thank you very much indeed, Shiha. The convulsions gripping Spanish women's football continue today despite a restraining order slapped on the country's former football chief by a court in Madrid. Luis Rubiales can't go within 200 metres of the footballer. He's accused of kissing against her will Jenny Hermoso, an accusation he denies. But in another development, almost all the World Cup winning squad said they'll continue their boycott of the national team until they feel in a safe place. Not the news, the new head coach was hoping to hear. 
he should still be basking in the glory of his country's victory in the Women's World Cup. Instead, the former president of the Spanish Football Federation has been in court accused of sexual assault. Luis Rubiales given a restraining order banned from being within 200 metres of the player he kissed. Despite his denials, her lawyer today insisting it wasn't consensual. She says Jenny Hermoso is still affected by the humiliating act she experienced in the stadium, which has tarnished such a great sporting milestone. This is the moment that overshadowed their win in Sydney. Luis Rubiales kissed Jenny Hermoso on the lips after Spain beat England to win the Women's World Cup. He claims she consented. She filed a criminal complaint. Under pressure, Rubiales finally resigned on Sunday. They seem quite willing to go the distance here, even if it means sacrificing their place with the women's national team and in further competitions down the road. I guess it just means, as we're saying, this is something so much more transcendental, goes beyond football, and it's really about their place in society and women's place in society. If found guilty, Luis Rubiales could face a fine or even a prison sentence. Rebecca Barry, News at 10. An agreement has been reached to sell the Premier League football club Everton to an American investment firm. Fans outside the club's Goodison Park ground in Liverpool were today absorbing the news that current owner Farad Mashiri had agreed to a takeover by the firm's 777 partners. The deal still needs approval from the Premier League, the FA and the Financial Conduct Authority. And finally, an award-winning British composer has been giving us an insight into his pioneering techniques, which are revolutionising blockbuster movie scores. Not content with traditional orchestral scores, Daniel Pemberton mixes music and sound from a host of sources, including instrumental, electronics, sampling, scratch and even the natural world. His work on major movies like the Oscar-winning Spider-Man spin-off is being hailed as the future of film music. Exploding onto screens in 2018, the Spider-Man spin-off pulled fans into the Spider-Verse with its Oscar-winning animations and its high-octane score. But the sound of Brooklyn streets was made in Britain from the mind of a man changing the way film scores are created. There's a sort of elitism where we look at orchestras and we go, that's proper music, and then people might look at dance music or hip hop and they can be slightly dismissive of it. But a virtuoso record scratcher is just as skilled as a you know, virtuoso um, violinist. It's this synergy of classical and more modern music that's earned Daniel Pemberton a name as an innovator. The composer establishing himself in British TV dramas with an Ivor Novella Award and multiple BAFTA nominations before the Spider-Verse gained him an Oscar nod. But he believes there's potential threats to creativity coming down the track. His latest project, Ferrari, one of only two movies to premiere with the cast on the red carpet due to the ongoing Hollywood actors and writers strike. Money is being made in the creative industries and I would rather that money goes to the artists and the creatives than the shareholders and venture capitalists. Part of the industrial action is over the use of artificial intelligence in films and while Pemberton is forward thinking, he believes AI could be detrimental to creativity, especially when thinking about how he came up with the sound of the Spider-Verse. The score in some ways is a very personal reflection of my sort of musical experience is through my life and that's the sort of thing that AI can't give you. It can't give you like the, the sort of digestion of a human being. Inspired by his teenage nights in clubs and raves in Brixton, the first film Into the Spider-Verse is about to start a UK tour alongside a live orchestra and for the composer, despite Spider-Man being an iconic American character, it's very much a homecoming for the music. Charlie Frost, News at 10. And that is it for tonight from all the team here. Good night, have a lovely weekend. <laughs>